Hello, everyone. Thank you all for being here today. I'm very excited that we're visiting John Kuhn. So one of the most commonly asked questions in the gallery, though, is how does he do it? And I'm so glad that in a couple of minutes, John's going to be able to finally answer that question. John wasn't always headed in this direction, though. Uh, he was born in Chicago, and I think for a long time it looked like John might have a career that would take him more directed into mathematics. Um, but he took a different route when he received a BFA in ceramics. And it was when he was at Virginia Commonwealth University getting his MFA that he made a transition from ceramics into glass. John is credited as being the pioneer in a technique called cold work glass, or some call it constructed glass. His work is very intricate, complex, as you all know, geometric. And I mean, to put it simply, they're really dazzling. Uh, there is a spiritual quality to John's work. And uh, John is a very spiritual person. And he believes that the goal of spiritualism, he'll correct me if I'm wrong, is perfection. His early glass sculptures were very organic and really lean, were influenced by his days in ceramic. They weren't glassy in any way. But early on in his career, he did have an accident and injured his right arm, and it made it difficult for him to handle the molten glass. And that's when he developed this technique of working with glass, of cold working. So life is about timing. And in 1987, John made his first cube. And in 1987, I met John in the back of a Volkswagen at a glass conference at Kent State University. And the rest was history, uh, or has been our history. It was the beginning of a long relationship that John and I have had. He's been an intricate part of the gallery of my family life, of my personal life, my business life for over 35 years and probably being one of my top selling artists all that time and a friend as well. So if you have any questions you'd like to ask of John during uh, our tour, please just uh, write them into the chat line or the Q&A and Daniel will ask them for you. And now it is my pleasure to say hello to John in his studio in Winston-Salem. Hi, John. Hey, Sandy, how you doing? It's, good. it's like we haven't seen each other, but I just saw you two hours ago, but it's good to see you again, John. Good to see you, Sandy. Yes. So I know that you're there with Rosie, your wife, Rosie, and we couldn't do this without her because she's gonna be on camera today. It's so true. Yes. And you, I'm not sure if your children are there at some point. Absolutely. Say, okay. Well, at some point, we'll catch up with them and we'll introduce them as well. Good. So, how are you doing? Doing well. Thank you. Yeah. And where should we get started, John? We have such a long history. Where are we going to begin today? Well, I have a display here of a few pieces uh, that were... Um, examples of, of where I've been uh, and, the, and examples of the journey. One interesting thing that, that I have, I've always had in my gallery, in my studio, is this painting here. Uh, it's a painting of a bullfight. You see the bullfighter and the bull? Yes. And the, I think they're called Toreadors in the audience around there. What's interesting is the bullfight, bullfighter's costume or uh, clothing you see the point list kind of technique of the painting. This painting was done when I was 12 years old. Wow. So I was already or influenced by the paintings of Georges Seurat, whose paintings I saw at uh, the Chicago Art Institute on tours there. And I was very interested in that point list kind of uh, approach to use of color. And so I've always looked back at this and thought, now I am a point list in glass, because that really is how I approach things. And I've always been interested in this repetition of forms, this uh, uh, just points of color, points of, uh, or dots of color. I remember in high school, 
uh, a teacher printed out what a million dots would look like on a computer printout. And it filled a major part of a wall of a classroom, one million dots. It's really a very large number. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's always influenced me. And, and uh, just that repetition of a simple form creates a new form. So now uh, in front of the painting, we have some early glass. Actually, the first piece of blown glass that I ever made. I did this, uh, went through the annealing oven, and came out the next day. <laughs> I looked at it. I thought, I certainly hope I can do better than this. So I, th I threw it away. A friend of mine rescued it from the trash can and saved it for 25 years and gave it back to me. And so I've kept it ever since. Then after that early work, I did this. I developed this chemical treatment, chemical treatment surface uh, that gave this kind of crusty uh, surface to it, which reminded me of natural forms. And then inside or beneath that surface, I put layers of color. So this related to ideas about landscape. Mm -hmm. Now, early on, as a, a 12, 13 year old uh, boy, I studied Zen Buddhism. I was reading books about Zen Buddhism. And by the time I got to glass, I recognized that this was similar in many ways to the Confucian idea of uh, one idea uh, of, of the world relating to another idea of the world. So here's a landscape, a rough landscape, but inside there's another idea about landscape. So I was studying Confucianism and the I Ching at that time, and also meditation. What attracted me to glass was this concept that I could look beneath the surface of the material and see what's inside. And so my job, as I saw it, was to create a different image inside or to create that image inside. So just like we're creating our own uh, image of ourselves, our own lives. So I was creating this image on the inside that related to the outside and also related to meditation. So I was really influenced very early from uh, in the, my work with glass about uh, the, the correlation between my spiritual studies and my studies in glass. Over the years, the work got more sculptural. I still had that same encrusted exterior, but the uh, forms got more, uh, got looser, more sculptural. And, but, and then there's still the landscape within. You see the horizontal looks and, and uh, the variety of color. I was also influenced at this time by the paintings of Morris Lewis and Sam Francis, which you all probably know are very colorist. They're Washington Color School and they, the, the blending of colors, the transparencies of colors, so like Morris Lewis, how drifting the paint across the canvas and, and seeing how the colors blended. So I was thinking about that uh, in these um, in these forms and seeing how the, the colors blended together. Uh, then, as you uh, mentioned, I had a uh, torque tendon in my elbow in the early 80s, I think it was, uh, 83 or 84, and uh, had a surgery, and I had to give up blowing glass. So I had to develop a technique that I, continue, I could continue to work in glass, but that uh, I would be able to employ other people to do the manual labor. And it was a little uh, disconcerting at times because I wanted to be involved, but recognizing my own physical limitations, couldn't, but I recognize that the creativity happens up here. This is where the thinking, the intellectual investigations happen, and the manual labor uh, is not necessary for the artist to do. An artist can to employ other people, and what I was essentially doing was grinding surfaces flat. So it doesn't matter if I'm grinding it flat or other people are grinding it flat. Flat is flat, and so I could uh, employ young people to do that. Uh, and then this is the first piece of that series that I made. And you see, it still had the, the rough exterior, which I wanted to 
I made sure for several for about a year of making this kind of piece because I was correlating it to the earlier work. And then the language inside that I was using uh, went past landscape and became more of a, a landscape or more of a language about uh, uh, kind of related to Japanese calligraphy. If you know uh, the, the uh, sculptures in Japanese gardens, the pagodas and, and different things, they all have this cal calligraphy. So I developed my own aesthetic language in these color patterns. And this is all fused glass on the inside and I coated it or covered it with a uh, piece of, of clear glass and then had this rough exterior. Over a period of years, a couple of years maybe, the exterior became polished too. And then you'll see in later columns, the, uh, are, they're totally covered all over. About that time, I was reading the books of um, White Eagle, who was an American Indian, uh, a spiritual shaman uh, in the Indian American Indian tradition. And he claimed that the cube was the most perfect spiritual form. So of course I uh, delved into ideas about cubes and this is an early cube in that period. Uh, still the color inside and again, uh, back to the aesthetic language of color and my own language related to color and ideas about weaving and mathematics. And I this, remember uh, related, those or this related to, uh, to this to White Eagle's ideas about cubes. I also studied cubes for a while. And noticed that the many artists use this form. Uh, my one of my heroes, Arnoldo Pomodoro, made some fabulous cubes, and probably the uh, most important artist, or one of the most important important artists, who's influenced me along with the painters that I've, I've recommend, uh, referenced. You notice at that time, they, I cut the corner off and it rest, rests on its corner. And then uh, collectors would buy these things and they'd put them on a plastic turntable and they'd spin them and they'd spin them off and break the corners. <laughs> so I would have to repair them. I, I didn't like being in business to repair my earlier work. So I ultimately, first I developed a, a glass uh, base for it that was larger footprint. And then I ultimately developed the stainless steel base that, that you see here. This is a current cube, a small one. And uh, there's ball bearings inside there and you see it spins nicely. So I, I don't have to do nearly as many repairs, which I like. <laughs> I'm not interested in repairing work. It's amazing how smoothly those spin. Well, the guys who do this work are, are really pretty good at it, <laughs> if I do say so. Anyway, um, the what is inside is uh, tiny bits of color and uh, clear lead glass. And again, Going back to the aesthetic language, the language of color and clear, and uh, that's, that's the, at the core of every piece. So I call it core material. The core material has evolved over the years. Uh, now I do, uh, I do all the small pieces and that's just where I start, but I also do, them, do some things in just clear, which you're gonna see. Here's a clear paperweight, it's all clear clear lead glass, but you see because of uh, the reflection and refraction of all the angles, it sparkles and creates all the colors, all the prismatic colors. So that's pretty nice. Mm, very nice. How many pieces of glass would there be in a small piece like that, John? <laughs> you know, I get asked that question so many times. I know, I do too. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to remember. Uh, let me see. Approximately. There are several thousand. Yeah. yeah. So uh, if I had if I had time, I could count them, but no, I don't want you to do that. It's fine. Good. 
<laughs> okay. So now I think we're going to go to uh, what we call the assembly room or glue room. Mm -hmm. Is that right? The glue room. Exactly. Okay. And we're going to see how it's done. Okay. Thank you. That is the secret. So uh, I think I've talked about why it's done. Correct? You talked about now we're that. Talking how it's done. This is the glue room. Now we're gonna look at lots of different things in here. We're gonna come back to this table. Yeah, this is the kind of overwhelming thing. in this space. There's a lot to see. Yes. Uh, the first thing I wanna do, I wanna go all the way to the end. Okay. Where the uh, color assembly, the beginning is of each piece. And Rose, if you could just scan the room different places and we'll come back, we'll be able to come back and see things and answer questions along the way. I want to go over here. You see behind me are, are racks of colored, strips of colored glass like this. I, we grind these flats. This is all bullseye glass from Portland, Oregon. Um, I lay out a color scheme like you see here and glue this down to a panel of, of, of uh, lead glass or spacer glass. Then once this glue, dry, glue is dried, I'll grind this flat. And smooth like this one is. So here's a color panel, and you see the other side. Take those color panels, laminate them together with the epoxy and the lead glass, alternating between color panels and lead glass into a stack about this. This is a color stack. See, this color stack goes out to the saw and it gets cut into panels through the layers of color. Those panels get ground and polished. You see, this is a cross section. Those panels get ground and polished and look like this. This is what we call a line panel. I see. This line panel is laminated together, glued together with uh, the same epoxy, alternating lines and clear glass, lines and clear glass. And once it dries, that stack, that line stack, is cut like this. Those cross sections are called dot panels and look like this. You see that? Yes. See all the dots in there? All the yes. dots, all the rectangles or, or parallelograms you see are all lead glass. The, the glass you can't see is a soda lime glass that's in between them, in between the lead. This dot panel becomes the first brick in the building of a block of color. So it's, it's often like a house, or I liken it to a house, and layer the bricks one on top of another to create the, a wall. So I'll take this uh, panel of dots over here. Oh yeah, you wanna do this? Okay. Yeah. So here we have a stack of dot panels. Look at all those dots. This stack of dot panels is laminated together, turning each one 90 degrees so that the dots don't line up, so that the colors don't line up, the dots right. don't line up. Mm -hmm. And you can see just with two of them how it gets more complex. And when you have 10 or 20 of them, it gets enormously complex. Then we have we have here the beginning of a cube. This is many layers of dot panels glued together. And this one is cased on four sides with four silicate glass, the clear glass is the final casing. Then you see this is the start of, and that particular one, I'm just leaving it the way it is. 
but in others, like this piece, the core is then cut and, and new panels of glass put in. So there's some large panels of, of glass. You see this turquoise that goes through it. There's some blue, some dark blue. And there's another. So every side becomes different. So the, the block of, of core material is cut several times, repolished, the uh, cuts are repolished, and then glued back together with color panels in between. You know, looking, is, looking at that, John, I, I see a difference in the way uh, you're using the color. It's, it seems to be almost like an abstract painting. It's, it's not quite as, it's more free form than some of your earlier works. Is that true? Absolutely. You know, I was always influenced by the painters and at the painters, or rather the attitudes of painters towards the work. Mm -hmm. And now with, without the uh, intense interest in production, like there was in perhaps the 90s and 2000s, uh, I'm able to approach each piece differently and separately and, and, uh, and have more intentional approach to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. So it, it is much more painfully. Very, very. I like it much. I like it very much. <laughs> so then uh, at some point here, okay. Okay, now we have over here, this is another piece that I'm, I'm particularly like. This piece is called Red Lion. Beautiful. Variation of uh, color there. And then uh, I decided it needed uh, something dramatic. On one corner, I put a panel of dark blue there. One of my favorites. Mm -hmm. Very nice. It's, uh, I, I now also put a, uh, what I call a footprint on the bottom. This is the footprint for Red Lion. And you see it has a blue panel going through it. This is what's going to be uh, laminated to the steel of the uh, stainless steel base. That's really a great effect, actually, that footprint that you're adding. You know, it, it, it happened, it, I, I brought it about because of, for technical reasons, but it's, uh, it's become an important uh, aesthetic uh, development as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, John, if I can just interrupt for a moment, we have our first question from a client okay. who would like to know, the client would like to know, how do you eliminate bubbles in the glue process? The, when we mix the epoxy, it's a two-part epoxy, we mix it in a, a uh, vacuum chamber, which is right over there. See the bubble, uh, the plastic bubble on top. So guess why I'm back. Okay. Right. Uh, we mix the epoxy and it's put in the vacuum chamber. All the air is pulled out of the epoxy. Then when it's applied to the glass, it's poured very, very slowly. Also, it's important that the epoxy be uh, go through the curing process at least about an hour before it's applied. So it starts to thicken just ever so slightly. So it's poured on slowly, and then the whoever's gluing it up uh, examines it to make sure there's no bubbles uh, involved in there. And then everything happens slowly. It's important that it happens slowly and carefully and requires a great deal of patience so, so that we don't trap things like air bubbles air or bubbles. dust or anything in there. And everything's examined at every step of the way to make sure that it's immaculate. Remember uh, when Sandra was introducing me, one of the things she talked about was perfection. And the, the idea there was uh, early on, I remember I had a piece that had an air bubble in it and it was all finished and it, was, it really bothered me that this air bubble was in there. And so I cut it apart, got the bubble out, put it back together, and I was much happier with it. But if the idea, the philosophy is about spirituality, 
we're talking about a subject that is as as perfection you know, the 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 spirit the inner spirit uh, if you want to call it god or the universe is about perfection so my technique my technologies had to be as close to achieving that idea of perfection as possible i'm a human all my assistants are human i'm not going to say that every piece is perfect but we have to, we keep striving for that, for that level of quality. And I remember always going back to that one piece that, that uh, I wasn't happy with. One bubble. And I do that on occasion. I cut pieces apart to get them better. That's an interesting piece here. So John, when you create a piece, um, like these are pieces that you're making there in your studio. I'm sure they're going to be available, but where do you start? Do you start with the color? Do you start with um, um, the shape, the size? What what gives you the energy to make these pieces? That's a complex question. Um, <laughs> what gives me the energy to to start these pieces? Well, I have a family to pay to support. Yeah, that's a start. Uh, but it's always the quest to keep evolving and growing as an artist, I have to say. And I've always had five to seven or eight, sometimes as many as 10 different forms I work in. But it's interesting. The cube has become probably one of the most popular my favorite forms over the years were the columns because they related to uh, some meditative visions I had about uh, a, a city, a spiritual kind of city that's about like a better world. So I like the columns. Uh, I also like the cubes. Uh, I've been able to push the cubes into a, a, a system of growth and uh, evolution uh, that... Um, I'm very happy with. Uh, if you look at my cubes over the 30 years, I think that I've been making them, they have continued to grow and evolve and, and change. This is an interesting development right here with this piece under my left hand. I had a shortage of glass and I had to uh, create the exterior glass. So I put it together with a ring down the center so this is like a Saturn's ring around. There's the core in, inside. You see the core with the layers of lead and clear glass around it. But then I have a Saturn's ring here. And then there's another layer, the next layer. This, this has the first and second panels of glass on it, the final casing. This is going to be the third and fourth layers. So see the, if you look up above, you have this strip of color here, color and clear pattern. And then this will be the third layer. We'll grind and polish the side and laminate the surface to it. So that this ring goes all the way around and that starts to create the, the ring for the, this axis. It's gonna be more blue. That's gonna be a, extraordinary piece. It looks like it's going to be. Is this this must be something new for you that you haven't done before then? I have correct. Yeah. That's correct. I've never Great done these direction. patterns. Mm -hmm. This is a so, brand new direction. I'm very uh, excited about it. I've got a couple of these in process right now. But you see they take so long. Oh my God. I don't oh. know. How long does it take to make a piece like that, John? How long would you estimate? Oh, a couple of years. Really? And, and how Red long? Lion. Red Lion was starting in February of 20. Um, uh, this piece was started in February of 19. It takes a long time because the glue has to cure for a week, then it has to grind and polish, 
and that takes uh, a while, then it comes back in. So I'm making several pieces at the same time, so mm -hmm. I can I can do other things while I'm waiting for for this one to move to the next step. I have to do several pieces at the same time. There always have to be pieces getting started, pieces in the middle someplace, and then pieces finishing. So it's just everything has to move in a long train, mm -hmm. uh, and it just got to keep keep it going. Got to keep feeding the train. So, so John, to keep things going, I know that you have assistants that work. You have a team. Um, yes. how, how many people are on your team? And what are their roles? Like, do they, uh, tell me how they interact with you, this team, with the work. I have one full-time, one part-time person in the glue room right now. Mm -hmm. uh, my full-time person here, a uh, young lady named Melanie, has been with me about a year. She has a background in ceramics. She has a Bachelor of Fine Arts in ceramics. She's very good, she's very organized, very effective. Uh, and then the part-time person is David, who's uh, been with me 15 years. He was full-time until the pandemic. And then he uh, took off for, for the safety reasons. You know, we all got shut down during the pandemic. And then uh, when he was able to come back, uh, he wanted to come back part-time because he had he had started his own artwork in his in his home, so he wanted to continue that. But of course, he needed a steady paycheck, so he came back to work with me again. David is on one project. He's just on this uh, project over here. He's building these stacks. This is a, a project that requires all clear lead glass, and so he's prepping all this material for this one project and you see we have we have the line clear line panels there and he's putting this all together you see he's done all this prepping it cleaning it and then well, this week he's going to start laminating it together Melanie does all the colored pieces and the more complex pieces because uh, she's here full time Mm -hmm. I started over here, I started talking about this. Now that you know how the color components, the color schemes are put together, I wanted to come back to this table. This is a, uh, a group of most of, of the color schemes for a, a, what I call a crescent. I've only done one of these. I've got two in process here, and it's going to have a color shift going from blue to gold or from gold to blue. So here is a, an image, a photographic image of the first crescent I made. You see the color shift. So this one was purple going to reds and gold out at the tips. Now you might ask how I got that curve there. How did you get that curve? Okay, I'm glad you asked. I knew you were waiting. <laughs> so I do the, I do all the, all the color schemes, and I will laminate the, the dot panels like this into a stack about so big. I'm an artist, I can't even draw a straight line. <laughs> anyway, you know, this is a color shift going from, in this case, from blue to gold, or in this mm -hmm. case, from purple to, to reds and gold. And then I'll, once the color shift is made, I'll cut it into a I'll spike like this. I'll take the excess glass, move it someplace else in the studio for other projects. I'll use it for something else. And I'll have this long spike of, uh, of this color shift. I'll have two of these. It'll be the dark color down here, or it could be the bright color, doesn't matter, but it'll transition through here. Then, I case it in uh, clear glass. I want to use different. Uh, case it in clear glass. To bore a silicate glass. Okay. And I'll cut this at angles. Slight angle this way. Another angle this way. This way alternating. 
And then I'll take all the small ones, small, small sides, small sides, and put them together. And then the difference in angles, or the change in angles, makes it appear just slightly curved. And all the, the surfaces are flat, but it's a series of flat ones that create this uh, um, uh, idea of a curve. So you see there's a, there's one there, and then there. I see. So I'm not drawing this really well, but you understand these are all the small, the small sides and all the big sides are on the outside and it creates this uh, uh, idea of the curve that you see in this image over here. And in this one that I'm working on right now, it'll be big gold area in the center out to blue here, or it could be blue in the center out to gold here. There'll be two of them because I'll have two, uh, two kinds of, two shifts of color. So, so John, what will the, oversi the overall size of that piece be? Looks kind of That's small for drawing of that piece, yes. What's this, the uh, size of it? That's 52 inches from the point to point. So over four feet. Yes. Wow. You talk about, um, or we talked about the influence that different painters have had on my career over the years. And I think this is one of the most painterly pieces because it is uh, very focused on, on the color and how to use the color, the, the dots of color, uh, and have that painterly attitude toward the control of the color. It's beautiful, very rich colors. It's amazing when you explain it, it makes a lot of sense, but it was hard to visualize how you could possibly create that shape. Beautiful. And this is the first piece you've made, the first crescent? This was the first crescent and I haven't been able to make another one. Uh, this is the second and third okay. in front of me. Okay. Blue and gold one. John, you said you use borosilica glass. Do you want to tell us what that is? That's the glass that you use for all your casings. Is that correct? That is correct. The lead glass, which is what I use, the clear glass that I use on the interior, of course has lead. It's a lead fluoride glass and the lead is makes it reflective and refractive. The borosilicate glass has no metal compounds in it whatsoever, no lead certainly, or any other metal compounds. The borosilicate is non-reflective, non-refractive, which means that when two pieces of borosilicate are laminated together, the glue joint virtually disappears. Whereas when there's lead there, you see through the surface of the lead. And mm -hmm. although you don't see the glue per se, you see the surface of the lead, and so that's what's reflecting and refracting. So the combination of the two different kinds of glass means that I can have the, the lead glass on the inside essentially floating. Looks mm -hmm. like it's floating. I see someone just asked a question. Gordon just asked, does the sunlight cause your glass to go yellow? Yes, yes. Uh, the borosilicate, because it has no metal compounds in it, does respond to the uh, UV rays and uh, there's uh, some uh, spotlights been developed, the low E lights that have been developed, so they have uh, almost zero ultraviolet in them. Uh, also, it's recommended that you put a film on your windows to protect the glass. Just like your paintings, you want to protect yes. your paintings, uh, you want to protect any artwork from the harm of the sunlight. The UV rays of the sun can affect every material. Yes. It, on the earth and you, know, you see it, what it does is fades your car finishes after a period of years and it's the same with uh, the borosilicate. Now the lead glass can go be outside in the sun and I'm told that it has almost zero change after 200 years. So I've always told my people, my, my clients, that if you have a problem after 200 years come back and see me, find me, we'll see what we can work out, okay? Good answer, John. Thanks. <laughs> if you can find me, uh, we're, we're both doing where, well. Where should we look? Uh, 
Probably not on this planet. Okay. Let's move along here. I showed you a circle earlier. This is the, there's some images of circles here. And there's images of a, from a page on a book here. You see all the images on the outside are all circle, circulars. Those were done on a lathe. And then at a certain point, I decided to, to do, them, do them in wedges. That's, they were all done in wedges, 12 components. Well, see, this one was, um, that one was, that one done in 12 wedges and then pieced together and then turned circular on a lathe. This one, I took the 12 pieces and ground them and polished them so that uh, it looks different. The problem with the, the uh, doing it on the lathe, the curved surface created a magnifying lens and I worked so hard at uh, making those inner components small, uh, it, uh, it was counterproductive to do the work on the lathe and it really added an aesthetic effect to do them in uh, 12 wedges like this. So this is what I'm doing now. I'm gonna show you a piece that's in process. This is a piece in blues. See, so there's four components here that are fully polished like this. And there's eight more components. We're working on this component right now. And this is gonna to come together into a, a circle like the one you just saw. Mm -hmm. This is going to be bigger and more complex than the one in the in the picture. This is a, a masterpiece, if I'd say so, or a, uh, I call it a uh, career piece. How long have you been working on this piece, John? Your career uh, piece. This this one was actually started before uh, before the recession, and then, uh, I, as you may know, I took a year and a half off after the recession to do some business restructuring and started back in this facility in 14. But uh, that was a period when pieces like this, sculptures like this weren't uh, as um, being acquired as readily um, because since it's such a big one and complex, it's probably gonna end up being rather expensive. And uh, so I've been look, working on it slowly in my spare time. Mm -hmm. So there's a question from Lisa. She wanted to know how heavy would a piece like that be, John? A piece like this one right here is probably two to 300 pounds. Wow. And will that be on a, how will that be mounted on a spinner? How will you, what will you do with that piece? I'll, I'll, do, I'll do a motorized pedestal for this. Okay. Yeah, I was so thinking. The, uh, I have a, motor in the, in the pedestal and we'll have an on off switch either on the side of the pedestal or it could be on the wall. The electrician can work that out. Mm -hmm. You've been doing those motorized pedestals for a while, haven't you? Yes, yes, I like them a lot. That's gonna be a beautiful piece. So when do you expect that yeah. piece to be finished? I don't, I don't project It's your like career that. piece. Okay, so it's gonna be a while. All right. Uh, I'm still a young man, and mm -hmm. so I have a lot of time left to finish this piece. Now, you talked about your spiritualism. What do you think took you in that direction? That you, I mean, it really reflects in your work, but I know it's what you live by as well. Um, what, what took you in that direction, more so than most people I know? Well, I think I talked about uh, my interest in Zen Buddhism as a kid and reading books. I'm not sure I understood it. I can't say that I understood what I was reading, but uh, my parents, I grew up in a Jewish family, so my parents were open-minded and they even took me to a Buddhist temple uh, because they thought I should be exposed to it. Uh, then I can't say what, what it was. It was just mm -hmm. that I was always drawn to uh, Eastern mysticism and Eastern thought and read books about 
Lao Tzu and, and Confucius and different philosophers, different Chinese philosophers. And I always found it fascinating. And of course, I studied the uh, book of the uh, Confucian book of oracles, the I Ching, and was very interested in that approach to life. Mm -hmm. And then I studied meditation. I've meditated for years. Uh, right now, I'm uh, for the past seven to ten years, I've been doing something called journaling, which is writing in a journal every day about uh, my thoughts and gratefulness to to the universe, to God, and and different things. It's uh, having an attitude of gratefulness is is and can be life changing. Mm -hmm. It's uh, changing of the of the uh, one's approach to life. Um, what it was that draw me, drew me to it, uh, I have to say, the idea that uh, I am creating the life, creating the person, creating the inner self that I want to create, rather than think about being created by the forces of, of the world around me, I'm consciously working on creating who I am and creating the life that I want to create. Does that answer that question? It did for me. I hope it did for other people as well. But I, I've known you for so long and I know it's always a very um, integral part of who you are and what you talk about and what you believe in. But I'm looking at this uh, piece in front of you that's so monumental. And I guess that's where your inspiration comes from to some degree for these pieces. Yeah, so I, I think the, uh, the, the thought process helps to create the work. Mm -hmm. And then the work influences the thought process. And it's a growth process, you know, it's, uh, I've all, often said that uh, life is like a staircase and you can't go from the bottom to the top in one leap, you have to take one step at a time. Mm -hmm. So life is like baby steps, uh, a little bit at a time, and if I can grow a little bit every day, by the end of the year, I've grown this much. Mm -hmm. That's... Uh, always been the focus. So I think there's a piece that's behind you that we saw earlier today. It's a long piece. I'd love, I'd love you to show that the one. Color shift piece? Yes. Okay, that's in the next room. Let's go. Oh, I thought it was just behind you. Okay. This is the and polishing room and storage. On my right, you see glass storage. And over here, you see glass storage also. John, that's a big space. How big is your, is your space? This room is 6,000 square feet. The front finished area is 3,600. So 9,600 all, all over, uh, close to 10,000 square feet. And how long have you been in this space, John? Since April of 14. Ah, for a while now. Um, and then we just got these machines in uh, a couple of days ago. These are grinding and polishing machines. Right here in front of me are a couple of vibrating machines where the glass floats around there. These whole, the whole machine vibrates and self-destructs over a period of time. These are big industrial machines for grinding and polishing. These, this company specializes in grinding and polishing flat surfaces. When I first started investigating them, I went to visit them. They told me that their, their intent is to grind within a thousandth of an inch, one thousandth of an inch of flatness. And they actually talk about light wavelengths of flatness. They think if they get beyond four thousandths of an inch out of flat, that they're, they're dismayed, they're depressed about that. So. Uh, that, in contrast to my previous ideas about flatness, where I thought about a 32nd of an inch, was, which is might be 30 to 35 thousandths of an inch, I thought was very remarkable. 
So I bought a couple of these machines used, had them refurbished, and they just arrived yesterday. And we're setting them up right now. This machine is going to be a fine grind. And the machine on my left is, a, is going to be a polisher. So you'll see where we do the rough grind in the uh, machines called Blanchards, which are uh, rotary surface grinders. And then they'll come over here to the fine grind and the polish. And we'll get things very, very flat. The, wow. the um, positive aspect of this is that it'll happen faster to get flat surfaces so they can get glued together faster. This should make my studio more efficient. So talking about the glue, do you make your own glue? No, I did for a period of time. The glue was evolved and developed by Texaco chemical engineers years ago, uh, back in the 60s and 70s, I think, when they were developing things, uh, formulas for uh, automotive finishes. One of those Texaco chemical engineers was named Herbert Hillary. He developed this uh, thing called Hextel. Uh, he retired from Texaco and uh, he was the uh, chemist and technician who was responsible for the repair of the Portland Bays for the Victoria and Albert Museum in England. And uh, the, if you remember the story about that, I think I, a very angry collector who wasn't able to own that piece for himself threw a brick through the display case, destroyed the piece. It was like 400 pieces of glass. Mr. Hillary, using the Hextel and colorants, we totally repaired it and it's uh, back in the museum and uh, in seemingly pristine condition. So he started to made this uh, epoxy for use by museum conservators and artists and other people who needed something really remarkable, really remarkable, uh, clear epoxy. And he started marketing it through a company called Conservation Materials. Mm -hmm. I was working materials in the early days of my career and I also have other artists like uh, Michael Taylor, David Hutchhausen, Bill Carlson and a host of others, uh, lesser artists, uh, Tolan Sand who's a good friend of mine um, and uh, worked uh, for many years with them. The uh, When Herb was dying uh, and they looked the uh, source of the, of the epoxy it looked like it was going to be drying up. I would call him while I was in the hospital. I'd ask him about the formula. <laughs> I'm not sure it was the, the uh, appropriate time. <laughs> what my mother make sure that I had a source for this. I was concerned about that at the time. You know, here I was developing this big studio. And um, my, one of my main sources was this guy in his late 70s who was making this epoxy. So uh, when he was uh, in the hospital um, and it, it did not look good, I would call him up and ask him about the, the formula. And he slowly gave me small pieces of it. And again, it's that idea by putting together all the small pieces and getting the large, a larger picture, I was able to give that enough of that information to chemical engineers at various chemical companies. They analyzed the formula and the, the, I sent them a sample. They analyzed the sample. They gave, put together the whole formula, gave it to me and they sold me the chemicals. I started making it myself. I hired a chemical engineer and I started making it myself. So I made my own epoxy for several years until Herb passed away and then his son, Nathan, Nathan Hillary, uh, decided he was going to make it. Nathan sold the, the formula to a company in Asheville, North Carolina called His Glassworks, who now makes it. And I decided it was in my interest to uh, buy the epoxy from His Glassworks. And uh, I'm not interested in being in the business of making epoxy. I just want to be an artist. Mm -hmm. I don't want to. So I buy my epoxy from His Glassworks now. And during the time that I had been making my own, I developed some auxiliary epoxies, one for fast glue that happens much faster, but it's not bubble free, it's full of bubbles. 
but we use it when we need uh, something to happen faster. Also a metal glass epoxy, which has more flexibility to it than the glass to glass epoxy. So uh, that's what I use for gluing the glass, the glass to the stainless steel stem. So now let's go over here. You asked about the long color shift, the long piece here. Yes. This is a particularly exciting piece. This is a commission I'm doing for one gentleman who will call it, whose name is Joseph. Um, and this is a color shift. 21 color schemes here. So it goes from red, red, orange to orange, orange, yellow to yellow, yellow, green to greens, introduce some blues, dark greens and blues, blue, green to blues, blue, purple, and then ends up with purple. The idea is to have all the colors of the spectrum, the rainbow in this piece. It's gonna be a ribbon. And here's a picture of a ribbon so that everybody in the audience knows what ribbons look like. And here's several ribbons that were made in my early days. Mm -hmm. But uh, this one is gonna be red out here, red, orange to yellow, green, blue, and end up purple over here. Now I've been working on this for over two years to get all the colors together. And I'm very grateful that Joseph is a very patient man, patient with me so that uh, I can do all this. Uh, fortunately, he can't afford to pay for the whole thing all at once. And I'm grateful for that also. It's a beautiful, it's always been one of my favorite. Say what? Sorry, I've lost you. It's a great shape, great form. It is. Yeah, very powerful. It's going to be a beauty. Okay. This is a piece, Sandra, that one of your clients has. That's right. I recognize it. I think that client may be visiting with us today, too. So I'm sure he'll be happy oh, to see great. that. Oh, that's great. Yes, yes. So in terms of color, so now we're going, like yes. how do, do you like working, like what's your favorite colors to work with or do you, uh, your favorite shape you say is this shape. In terms of color, do you like using multiple colors or do you like, you know, um, just shades of one color? Do you have a favorite? You know, I don't really think I have favorites. Uh, maybe I like some colors more than others. Uh, I tend to like red, blue, and gold the best, but mm -hmm. uh, when I use other colors, I like them because it allows me more variety, more variation. I especially like the color shift, as I said earlier, because of the painterly effect that I can get, the control of color. And it, so it's more, not about any specific color, more uh, but more the, about the control of all the colors hmm. and the way they together. And that's a, a, a painterly attitude. Yes. I mean, that's quite, I found that quite amazing, actually. 21 color schemes there. Yeah. I'm, I'm pleased with that. So if you remember uh, going back to the stacks of how the colors were made or how the, the piece started, there were 21 stacks made for that initial piece, for that uh, initial idea, back in the beginning. Yes. Wow. And you said this will be completed? Did you say another two yes. years? It'll be completed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's no death. <laughs> Maybe it's not two years. <laughs> it's another career piece then. I think so, without yeah. question. Uh -huh. It'll be, be completed in my lifetime. So how well, large I, how large I, will I, be? Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. No, I was going to say, how large will this ribbon be when it's completed? Uh, you know, I don't know. You don't uh, know yet. Go okay. past that sometimes, and it, it's going to be it's going to be about this big. Mm -hmm. Someplace in here. Okay, you can kind of put your arms around it. <laughs> uh, it's going to be as big as it gets. 
So John, what, what inspires you? I mean, this particular piece was a commission piece. So um, where do you go from here? What's inspiring you for your next uh, step or your next vision? I'm inspired by life, I have to say, uh, and everything and everybody I come in contact with. So everything that comes, comes into my senses, into my brain, becomes food for inspiration. Specifically, ideas about color from different painters that I might look at. Uh, also, obviously, my interest in spirituality that... Uh, um, I'm not sure if I talked about it, but do we, did I talk about that, that health issue? You haven't talked about that, no. Okay, so, so um, four years ago, I had a uh, or rather a significant health issue. And uh, I was lucky to have the surgery. They got it all out. And uh, sometime in the recovery process, I had what's commonly known as, uh, or commonly referenced to as a near-death experience. And uh, people probably have heard of this, if not experienced it, but you go down a long path, a long tunnel, a dark tunnel at the end of which you see the light. And uh, it was a awe-inspiring light. It's uh, um, the kind of experience that there's only one word to describe is it, just wow. It's, it's absolutely cannot be described in words. And as the light faded in front of me, I heard a voice say, this is the light that will inspire you, inspire the artwork from here on out. So uh, you, you see that with the clear core material. Uh, you see that, remember that paperweight that I showed you on the table, uh, it, uh, ideas about light. And I try to think about that uh, in, in every piece, it's something, some reference to the light and how the light is going to uh, interact with the piece. And, and I try and put some element of that, that idea, that concept of light into each and every piece. I always uh, thought of myself as being a partner with the light, but I saw it as uh, more of a physical uh, experience or a physical partnership. And like in the gallery, when we put the spotlights on the piece, uh, so I was a partner with that spotlight up there. But after this experience, I recognized that it's uh, a partnership with really the inner light, the spiritual light, the, uh, the light from within. And uh, so that's been very influential. But remember that life is a constant inspiration and so I'm influenced by uh, painters and and uh, uh, everything that I come in contact with but I would say overall the experiences with my spiritual studies my meditative visions and the uh, that one experience I had with seeing the light was probably my most significant. So we're at the point in the studio now where we go to the big grinding and polishing machines. Mm -hmm. And I talked about this a little bit before. We have the, uh, what, uh, these are hand grinding machines. Then we turn them on. And I buy these machines, bought these machines from his platform. And uh, they're saying, Here's the water coming up out of the center. This is a diamond impregnated, diamond coated panel that's electromagnetically applied to the, the wheel underneath. So is this the, oh, sorry, the last stage before the pieces are, are put together before you use the glue? Or on no, smaller. This is used at every stage. At every at, stage, okay. Every every time we cut something, mm -hmm. we'll have to 
prep it here for a hand grinding. So this goes through, we have this panel mm -hmm. with the diamonds impregnated here. Right. And we go through a series of uh, panels of, of these uh, electromagnetic panels uh, that just magnetize this, okay. this uh, substrate. Mm -hmm. And this is how we keep this surface flat. You remember mm -hmm. I talked about flatness with those lap masters. Now, over here, you see various pieces and stages uh, being prepared for the grinding and polishing stage. Uh, in the far distance, you see uh, a big gray machine, which is a gantry saw. Mm -hmm. And that's where we saw all the pieces. And then after the saw, they'll come around, they'll be prepped on the, the Covington machines I just showed you, these uh, hand grinding machines. And then, then they come through here, right through here. Okay. Uh, and, and this is the Blanchard grinding department. <laughs> and uh, so we have a rough grind and then a fine grind and polish. And mm -hmm. these blanchards are what, what I use now for grinding and polishing everything. I see. Those are big so machines. The idea down. here, th these are industrial machines. Put the glass on the table, surround it with steel, turn the magnet on, magnet holds the steel in place, steel holds the glass in place, table rotates, and a, a diamond grinding wheel comes down and grinds the top flat. After it finishes polishing in here, it goes to the glue room and they glue this glue together. After the glue cures, comes back out here, cut, ground, polished, and then it goes back into the glue room for more lamination, back and forth, back and forth. Do that several thousand times, and lo and okay. behold, you have so, a sculpture. So let's go take a look at some sculptures. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> See the finish. See the finished product. Please join me. Thank you. A finished cube, a pyramid. Look at this pyramid, I this pyramid. Yeah, I haven't seen a pyramid in a little while, John. Well, this is the last one made. This was made after my visit to Mexico and seeing the pyramids at Teotihuacan. So you see the color patterns in there relate to the images or the, the color patterns I saw in buildings and, and different uh, uh, areas, textiles in Mexico. Yeah, you can really see that. I see the photographs behind you too, a little bit of down memory lane. Right. I was uh, younger and nobody's gonna mention that I also looked thinner then. No, we we're not going to talk about that. Uh, some lady named Oprah. Ah, okay. And uh, when I got my doctorate, Doctor of Fine Arts, and uh, uh, I was in, I was a uh, piece of mine was acquired by the White House for the White House collection. That's I was at the White House, got my picture taken with the. Bill and Hillary. Okay, now so one more piece in here. Lost you. Okay. Um, a cube that's about reds. It's got some blues and purples, but mostly reds. That's your favorite direction. Isn't well, it? I like this piece. I don't know if it's my favorite, but I like mm -hmm. the piece. Mm -hmm. I like the way you've added the additional core at the base of the cubes. That's something. Yeah, this is what we call the footprint. A footprint, yeah. And and uh, one person called it a a reflective pool, where mm -hmm. all the color from the center sank down into a pool at the base of the piece. Yeah, that's a beautiful piece. Here's one of those columns that I talked about earlier. Yeah, that's a very nice column, that particular one. It's called Anything Sheltered Spirit. Uh-huh. Sheltered Spirit. What's the height of that piece, John? 
27 and a half inches right there. Mm -hmm. It's okay, very it's big, it's very heavy. Okay, beautiful. There's a, the, the idea here was that this cube was the theme. So all the colors in that, in that theme, in the main theme of the piece, will be used in a variety of ways throughout the rest of the piece. So it's theme and variations, like a musical composition. So clear core material up the center, the theme, and then the, th the variations of color around it. Very nice. I, I like that piece a lot. I love those yeah, colors like you do. I know they're your favorite colors. I happen to like them a lot. Okay, and then I think I saw another column. Oh, that's a gorgeous piece. So this is one of your newest directions. Yes. Yes, this is called Landscape of Light. And this references that, uh, that light that I saw during the near-death experience. And it's a landscape, but I, I think of it a landscape because it's horizontal. Mm -hmm. Horizontal comes from the word horizon, and this is flat like the horizon. It's all clear lead glass, but because of the reflection and refractions, it has, it encompasses all the colors of the rainbow. So will you be making more of these pieces in this direction? I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But they'll be different than this. Yes, yes. But flat, which is new for you. Yes. Just exquisite. Really beautiful. And here's something brand new, Sandra, that just came in a couple of days ago. Just finished. It's not actually not finished. The metal work is not finished. But I wanted to bring it in and show you. It's uh, one of my uh, tables. I haven't made tables in over 10 years. And this is, uh, I put together a lot of different glass components that, that I had. Uh, I made this whole composition. And then the table presents them all. So this, uh, the center component was made during a, a rather confusing period during my life. And I saved it until I could make this table and see the, the con confusion in the center, not knowing which way to go, pointing in different directions and then pointing out at the, the uh, structure of, of life out here on either side. And what's the size of that table, John? I think it's about four feet from one end to the other. I haven't measured it. Oh, well, let's see. It's 24 inches here and pretty close to four feet long. Mm -hmm. And the glass that goes on top could be uh, longer or shorter, depending on what the person who wants it. Right once for their own space. Yeah, I've always Next liked we have, a small, we have a smaller cube called, what's this one called? What's it called? Oh, okay. Is it called, this is Golden Plume. I always forget the name of this piece. Nice piece full of golds and reds. Very nice, the royal colors. Yes. Okay, that's royal in a lot of cultures, I guess. Uh, this is, I think, the, oh no, it's not the piece I thought. It's not the piece on the Evite. Is this this is called Layers of Awareness. So we have the clear core in the center and then layers of glass, layers of, of borosilicate and lead glass around it, just layers and layers and layers. So it's about layers of awareness and always coming back to the center where the soul is, the core, the understanding, the light at the center, layers of awareness. John, what's the size of that piece? I think this is eight by eight. Eight inches here, eight inches here. It's probably about 16 inches tall. Mm -hmm. Dan, don't you have the dimensions on everything? Yeah, we, Dan, we, know, we, yeah, we yes, do have dimensions. Yes, I do. 
And what we'll do is we'll send out professional images and dimensions of all the available pieces tomorrow morning. I have a good memory, but not for everything. <laughs> okay. Now, the piece that you were referencing, Sam. Yes. Which is Ocean Spirit. Yeah. Look at the color here. Variety of colors, very painterly. Every side is different. Turquoise, greens, blues. Can I turn it? Yes, please do. Look at that. Gold. Nice little area of blues there. Subtly covering some other colors beneath it. And back to the first one. Yeah. This is a gorgeous piece. Beautiful piece. Look at the uh, the footprint, the colors in, in the footprint. So, you know, it's always wonderful with your work to see the reflection on the wall. I, I always feel the reflection is as important, you know, looking at the piece. It's great yes. to see. This, uh, speaking of the wall, this is a wall piece that in reds, and this was made about the same time as the uh, piece I made for the table. And it's, again, the confusion in the center pointing out towards order and structure on either side. So confusion, chaos within structure. And this was made from uh, 2013 to 15. Mm -hmm. Are you planning on making more wall pieces, John? I am, but uh, I've taken a break from them for several years because I, I wanted to get past this... Uh, uh, un, unstructured, uh, disruptive area in my personal life and I uh, get to where I was more structured. So I just made one that is much more, can I say, structured and organized. It's a small one that I like very much. And I'm going to do more wall pieces and more, uh, more of those tables revolving around this very orderly idea. You said and you hadn't course, made tables in 10 years. I know right. 10 years ago, we had a number of them in the gallery, which we sold. Yes. Another uh, a column, one of my favorites, along with the first one you saw. This has a little bit less color. Uh, there are seven bars of color in the first one. There's five bars of color here. And uh, there's this is more monochromatic, more towards the reds. The other one had lots of greens and blues in it as well. Yeah, those are very rich colors though in the cube. Nice variety of color. This is a small landscape. I particularly like this piece. That's a very sweet piece. I love this. See, each one of those components was finished individually. This is the um, idea about finishing the components, componentizing the, the structure. Instead of making the, putting the whole thing together and grinding it as one solid piece, I made each of these individually and pieced them together like this. And then there's a ball bearing in there so it can spin real nicely. I just love this little, it's a little jewel. Mm -hmm. does look like a little jewel. Um, I don't know if you remember the size of that offhand. The, this is four inches by four inches, and the a base is about six by six, approximately. Right. And the whole job. thing is four and a quarter inches tall. Uh -huh. Congratulations on this new series. It's a great direction. Thank you. I love it. There's a, a blue a wall piece I put right next to it because the colors uh, go well, go so well together. Blues. You look a little more settled down in that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah. I thought you were going to say I look a little more settled down right now. But, no, I think well, I that, that, that particular wall piece compared to the others, there did seem to be a lot of confusion in the other ones. Not that that doesn't make them interesting. Okay. 
Right, perhaps even more interesting. This is a circular piece. Look at this. This is the one, you know, talked about the 12 components all being ground and polished and finished mm -hmm. separately. So this is what this was. This wasn't put on the lathe. And you get more interaction, more reflective, refractive qualities like this. And it's on a tall base with these blue components all the way around the rim. Mm -hmm. That's really such an elegant, protective. very, very elegant piece. Very beautiful, John. Thank you. So there's just all clear glass and blue. It looked like there was a little gold, but it's probably just the reflections. Correct. The only color in here is what's on the exterior, this little stripes of blue. Right. Everything on the interior is clear lead glass. Mm -hmm. Very beautiful. Another small cube, mm -hmm. titled, titled Breeze, and a larger cube with a variety of colors, very painterly piece, titled Memories. Look at the colors in this. Turquoise, blues, golds. Very beautiful. Pink of red. Very dimensional, the, the color in the uh, core. Yeah, this is a, a beautiful piece. And look at the turquoise in the footprint down there, the color down the footprint. And that piece is called? Memories. Memories. So when you look at this, if you own it, you will always have memories of your visit to the Kuhn studio. <laughs> And now, at the end of a long day... You're going to sit down, John, and take some questions? I'm going to sit down right here next to this table that I refer to as my martini table. So it rotates, and I can put my martini on top. My wife can sit on the other side, and we can share a martini by rotating the table. <laughs> That sounds like a very good idea. At the but end I of a long day, yes. Yeah. So for now, I, for, I wanna say thank you. That was an actually, it was just an excellent tour and I learned a great deal. So thank you very much. And sure. I know that we probably have quite a few questions people would like to ask you. So now that you're comfortable in sitting down, Daniel will ask those questions or Ask of our audience. Perfect. So if you would like to ask John a question, you're welcome to use the Q&A or the chat feature at the bottom of the screen. And we were able to answer a number of the questions during the tour. I recall you once saying to me, John, you have no secrets. You will tell people exactly how you make their, your, your work so they can go home and make it themselves. So we have, Absolutely. A, few <laughs> we have, a, few, we, we have a few technical questions. Uh, Jonathan would like to know, uh, what is the reason for mixing lead glass and soda lime glass in the process? Well, they have different, uh, different index of refraction and reflection. Lead glass is reflective, refractive. Soda lime and borosilicate are not. Soda lime actually has a slight, slightly different uh, index of refraction, but uh, basically very different from lead glass. Thank you. Darren would like to know, do you ever fall in love with a piece so much that you, you can't sell it, that you keep it for yourself? Um, yes and no. Yes and no. I had, uh, I had one of those career pieces in here and it was one of my favorites and it was priced uh, fairly significantly. And it was one of my favorites. So I thought, you know, I'm just going to double that price. That way, if I, can, uh, if I ever sell it, somebody can, I can make another one. And then it became my wife's favorite too, Rose, who I expect you'll meet later today, tonight. Um, yes, we're waiting to meet her. She's, uh, she's my cinematographer tonight. I know. So, uh, 
she loved that piece too. So I thought, okay, I'll double it again. And then uh, a gentleman and his wife walked in and uh, I wanted to sell that tall spinner in a circle over there. And they walked right past it. And I thought, oh. And uh, they walked to this uh, hanging wing that was, I just described as my favorite career piece. And, and he says, I like this. Well, I had it priced at over half a million dollars. Well over half a million. And he said, I like this. I said to him, I said, that's my wife's favorite piece. I promised her I would not sell it. And his wife looked at him and said, I would love for this piece to be in our living room. So he looks at me and he says, well, John, do you want to sell it or not? And I thought, for that kind of money, I can take my wife to dinner and apologize to her. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. That's what I did. I mean, for that money, you know, you can, uh, <laughs> you can go to a couple of different dinners. And uh, that's what we did. Uh, I'm, I installed it in their home in Florida. And uh, they're very happy with it now. They also have a couple other pieces of mine that they got previously. And um, so that was a, a nice day. That, that actually made that year. Uh, so in response to your question, what I say for myself is the work that doesn't sell. And, uh, you know, honestly, I can't afford these things. <laughs> That's not unusual. A lot of artists will say that, John. Yeah, I, I really, you know, I got a family to support, feed. I got three kids to put through college. Mm -hmm. Who can afford this stuff? Not me. Okay. I, I, I live on artist wages. Okay. Do you have another question, Dan? Yeah, Anne would like to know what percentage of your work is spoiled or, I guess, unsuccessful in the process. Does that really happen with your work or can you always deconstruct it? resolve any issues, and then reconfigure? I would say nothing is ever spoiled because I can cut it apart and go in a different direction. Uh, I have a piece that I didn't show you in there that uh, went through a process that I decided I didn't like. I kept trying to make it work, and, and everything I did just it ended up worse. Um, so I just put it aside for a year, maybe two years, and I'll come back to it with a different mindset and a different uh, uh, attitude. And I'll make it, uh, I'll bring a new perspective, a fresh outlook to the pie. And uh, it's, it's always important to come to everything with, with a fresh mindset. Whenever there's a stumbling block, you know, you get uh, that thing called uh, writer's block or artist's block. Uh, right. It's important to just set things aside and move on with something else. It's, and then it's easy to come back and uh, a few things with a fresh uh, uh, point of view. Thank you. Darren would like to know, do you get, ever get asked for commissions that don't fit your personal vision? And how, how do you handle that situation? I have a couple of commissions. I actually have a display of unrealized projects in the gallery, in the, out there in the studio that uh, we forgot to look at, but it's uh, uh, that I thought all of them were in line with my personal vision. I was excited about all of them at various times, but they all became uh, prohibitively expensive. And uh, for that reason, I think uh, they got pushed to the wayside, but I've learned from every one of them. And I can go back and, and rethink some of them. Maybe not for those that particular client, but for somebody else. Um, do, do I ever get a commission that is not in line? Well, the best example of that, and this didn't happen. Uh, I, uh, an art gallery owner brought a client to me and he said, you know, I made my money in the dairy business. And so the dairy business is very important to me. And I sold the business and now I've retired to the lake and I have a nice sailboat. So I want you to make me a nice big column. I want you to put a cow on one side and a boat on the other. The art gallery owner took one look at my face and knew that that wasn't going to happen. 
so um, that's probably the the uh, funniest, most humorous example of a commission that that would not happen. The idea of commissions is is good uh, if when the person who commissions it is able to give free reign to the artist. For example, you see this piece, like here, it's all clear white glass. John, would you make that and put some blues in it or some other colors? Of course, I can do that. Or that cube or whatever, any of, the, any of my forms. But the more the client comes up with the idea of what to do with it, the more it becomes about the client and becomes the client's piece and the less becomes mine. And therefore there's no reason for me to do it. He should go someplace else. Because what it does, it, it demotes me to just the level of being a craftsman. And that's not what I want to do. I, I at this point, am mo most interested in expressing my philosophy, my ideas and, and my aesthetic. Well, it's, it's as you said, the artwork is here, you know, it's in your mind, in your head. That's where the artwork right. comes from. Yeah. Right. And our last question, I believe, comes from Leon. You, you went into really great deal of uh, detail how exactly you create the core, but Leon wants just a brief description of how you encase these pieces in clear glass. Well, after the core is created, because the core is where all the work is made, take that core, grind and polish on two sides, add clear glass to those two sides. Then grind and polish on the next two sides, add clear glass to those two sides. Then grind and polish on these last two sides, add clear glass there. And then you have the fully encased core, and which is the simplest idea for some of these cubes and then grind and polish the whole thing into a cube. And you have the, the very complex core at the center. Question. Very good. Very easy, piece of cake. I do it all the time. <laughs> and you do it beautifully, John. And Thank we you. really appreciate all the time that you've given us today and all the questions you've answered. Even I understand things much better now than I did when we got started. So thank you. Mm -hmm. And I guess to our next um, 35 years. Here's to it. May the next yes. 35 to 50 years be as good as the first 35. Yeah, exactly. And it's productive <laughs> for you. Amen. I yes. Yes. Yeah. So do you want, um, uh, is Rosie there? Would she like to say hello to us? Um, yes, she's coming here in a minute. Or the kids, oh. whatever you like before we say goodbye. She's, uh, she's, the kids are all in my office. Oh, okay. On, on their laptops or phones or whatever electronic Being devices. quiet, so that's good, right? Right, right. I have three children. Their age is 15, our daughter is 15, our son's 14, and our little boy is five years old. Uh, if I can get him, get a handle on him and get him to sit still on my lap, you'll see him. He's a little shy, but uh, I think he's coming. I hear footsteps. Oh, good. And okay. Just a minute, I, I think. know they wanted to meet everyone. That's fine. Jaden, tap tap. Come here, buddy. Hi. Sandra's here. Say hi, Sandra. Hi, Jaden. How are you? And Rosie. How are you? Oh, there's more kids coming. Oh, who's there? Is that Seth? No, that's, yeah, is that Seth? Yeah. Seth yes. and Nina. Nina. Okay, hi. Thank you for looking after Jaden while your parents were involved in our tour. We really appreciate it. And Rosie, say hello to everybody. You're kind of cut off. Maybe come in. Hi. There we go. <laughs> you did an amazing job for your first time. You did a great job, Rosie. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So it's great to see all of you. And uh, I look forward one day to coming back down to Winston-Salem and meeting you all in person. I look okay. forward to it. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.